Yo, what's up beautiful people of YouTube? Welcome back to Dom's Media Zone. In today's video, I'm going to be going through the Perform Image Lens Correction tab in Canon's Digital Photo Professional 4. Now this tab is one of those tabs that I found the most confusing when I started using Canon's DPP-4. So this tab does have some options that can be quite confusing if you don't know what they are or what they mean. So I'm going to try my best to explain each option in this tab so that we can go through it together and make sense of it even more. So if this is something that interests you, stay tuned and enjoy. Hi everyone and welcome to today's video. Today we're doing a Canon Digital Photo Professional 4 tutorial about this tab over here which is called the Perform Image Lens Correction tab. Now this is one of the tabs that I found most difficult to understand when using Canon's DPP-4. So I decided let me try figure out what each of the functions do and then go and make a video about it so that we can all try and understand how to best use this tab. So I'm going to select a photo that I want to demonstrate on and then click on edit image this photo will now open up and then I'm going to go ahead here and click on the perform image lens correction tab as you can see it opens up the tab with all the options that apply to this tab and what I'm going to do is go through each one of these and try to make sense of them all so starting on the top here you've got the sub window thing here this is really a good tool because it allows you to select a part of the image so by clicking over here you are activating this button which allows you to move your mouse which becomes like a little crosshair through your image and zoom in on something specific so that you can see how your changes are affecting the photo. So for example, I'm just going to zoom in on this R. So click on the area where you want to zoom in. And over here, you can as well zoom out a little bit if you go one to one or you can do one to two, which zooms in one to three and so on. So it lets you really zoom in to that letter that you're looking at or whatever part of the image. If you want to change it, click on that again and you can move your mouse around and find the part. So let's focus on the R because as you can see, I can already spot some issues over here in this image that aren't visible if you don't zoom in so that's what this is good for now up next we've got something called the shooting distance information so this is just telling Canon's DPP-4 how far away from the subject you were this when working with raw images and if the shooting information has been saved to the image or to your photo the slider is set up automatically so as you can see here I don't need to change this so the information from the photo already told the software that the subject was about there so it adjusted it for me. Now, if there is no image information saved on the image, the slider will automatically get set to this infinity mark over here, and this symbol will appear above it. So have a look at the symbol over here. I'm just going to paste it. That means the image did not have distance information on it, and you might need to adjust this manually. So if you need to adjust this manually, just keep in mind that if you took a photo of something that's really, really far away, set it to infinity. If you took like a macro photo, set it to over over here which is right in the left hand side and that means you were really close to the subject if it's something in the mid-range or a portrait something like that you could set it here it should in most cases be done automatically by your computer and this just helps the Canon's DPP-4 to figure out where the subject should be what you're focusing on now up next we've got this lens data section over here now this is really good because it allows you to import the data for specific lenses so that Canon's DPP-4 can take the best data and the best information that's been specifically set up for that lens and use it to correct your photo. So if you can see over here, it says lens data, no, that means that there's no lens data yet saved. So what you'll need to do is import the information. So you will need an internet connection to do this and you can do this by clicking on this button over here. So if I click on this button, you'll see now it opens up a section called add or remove lens data and it lets you select the lens that you were using. Now, in most cases, it will detect the lens or automatically as you can see it's highlighted here I was using the EFS 18 to 55 millimeter lens and it's already got a check because I have selected this before and imported the data before but I will do this again now so I'm going to select the lens that I want now over here there's a button called destination folder now this just lets you decide where you want the lens data to be saved because it will import the data into a folder on your computer for future use normally it just goes into a default folder which I tend to leave so I'm just going to say cancel but if you wanted to you can change your folder now once you've selected that and you can see it's highlighted you've got the tick over here just go ahead and click start 
as you can see it's downloaded the lens data over here and then over here it tells you yes that the lens data has been downloaded over here if you look at this r you might have missed it the r had these funny red and green colors around it now because we've imported the lens data it corrected it automatically for us and it decided where the most optimum part to adjust the slider would be to correct our image so this digital lens optimizer the function is to enable resolution of images to be increased by removing the aberration or diffraction so by having this selected it automatically corrects this diffraction and aberration here now you can see that by having this ticked these two options are blurred out which means you cannot do automatic lens data and this at the same time because they pretty much do the same thing so these options are if you want to do it more manually and this option is if you want the computer to decide for you based on that data that we've just imported so you'll see if I uncheck this now my R goes back to how it was a little bit funny. It's got some aberration here and you can see that these two options are now available. So for the time being, I'm just going to leave this unchecked and I'll show you how these two work right now. But before I do that, it's worth pointing out that there's a list of cameras that this functionality does not work with. This digital lens optimizer here, I'll put this up on the screen right now so you can see. So this list over here is from the Canon's DPP guidebook and these are basically the cameras that this will not not work with so if you're using any one of these you might not be able to turn on the digital lens optimizer all right so starting off with the diffraction correction this is probably the most complicated setting on here on this whole tab most difficult one to explain and it doesn't occur often so what it basically is it's to do with the light waves interfering with each other so if you take photos with a high f-stop so for example f22 f25 or higher than that or in other words small aperture so if the aperture on your lens is really small what happens is it's supposed to give you a really sharp photo but because of this kind of phenomenon with the light waves it actually makes some part of your photo really blurry and now there's a whole scientific explanation for why this occurs and I will not attempt to explain it because I would probably butcher it completely but instead if you are interested and you want to dive more into the details of this I will put a link to this web page here where they talk about the lens diffraction in detail they pretty much explain it to you scientifically what actually happens and why this occurs like this is the small aperture that I was talking about so they will explain this to you in this article if you want to dive into details go ahead but basically in a nutshell what it is is if you've got a raw image like you can see over here in this example and this has been taken with a very high f-stop and it was uncorrected so we didn't use that diffraction correction option you can see for example some of this image parts are a bit blurry here like if you look at these rings on this watch here they are blurry and this is with that diffraction correction activated they're a bit more visible and not as blurry as they were here so for example even this ring here you can see it's got a little bit of blur to it whereas this one is very sharp so enabling that diffraction correction makes your image super sharp when that phenomenon occurs in your photographs which to be honest I haven't seen in any of my photos unless I haven't noticed so now back to our photo because we got the hard one out of the way you can always switch this on for yourself I'm sure it does no harm in just keeping it switched on so up next we've got this chromatic aberration now what that does is controls the blue and red tint glow around specific items so as you can see here on this letter R you've got kind of like a pinky ready glow and over here you've got a green glow so that's what corrects this in the photo now the trick to this is to find a balance so that it looks natural so I'll show you an example so if we enable this right now you can see it disappears so then you might think okay well let me increase it all the way to make it even better but if we do that if we increase it all the way you can see that it actually moves this red and blue channel to the other side of the extreme and it still comes up if I move it all the way to the left hand side it just switches them around so instead of the green becomes the red and the red becomes green and vice versa so what you have to do is kind of play with the slider if you're doing this manually and find the most optimal point as you can see this looks kind of good but I think around 120 in my case is pretty good here now this red and blue also controls the amount so if I move this to the left you can see it comes back if I move this to the right it just flips it 
it around and the colors are still there so keep that somewhere in the middle and then try to find a point in here if you're doing this manually if you're not doing this manually if you're letting the digital lens optimizer select for you those two will switch off and i find that this digital lens optimizer does a really good job probably does a much better job than i do manually correcting it here so find a good balance where you feel it looks the best and just leave that slider on that point over here or wherever you find it looks the best when you zoomed into something up next we've got this color blur setting over here now the setting it corrects the blue or red color blur that sometimes occurs at the edge of the highlighted area of an image now i've been searching for an example of this on my photos but couldn't really find any now this is because it only affects certain lenses and not many of them are affected but basically turning this on makes the color transitions in those areas more crisp now i've been trying to test this out on one of these images so i've got an image here where blue meets red and if i click on edit image and go back into that option and select the area where kind of blue meets red over here i can zoom in a little bit on that area so if we scroll down to the color blur switching this on is supposed to correct this which i don't see anything wrong with it in the first place so i don't think it does anything on this lenses that i've been using but in your case if you do see some color blurness or smudging between the transition of the blue and red go ahead and turn this on in actual fact i would just recommend leaving this on anyways that's what i do it does no damage at all so going back into our main photo that we're editing i'm just going to jump back into it great and now we can move on so leave the color blur switched on it doesn't do any harm up next we've got an option called the peripheral illumination now this corrects the edges so sometimes the edges in the photo can get darker on some lenses and what this does is corrects them so take a note at the edge let's have a look over here it's a little bit dark here 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 if i switch this on you can see it automatically brightens the edges up so have a look again this is switched off this is switched on and here you just control the amount of illumination you want to add so i could go all the way to 120 and it made it brighter if i move it all the way down it makes it darker again so this is to do with the edges of your lens so depending how your lens performs that's how much you're going to need over here so in this case i'm just going to leave this at about 90 and that corrected it quite well all right next up we've got the distortion now the distortion corrects the fisheye effects of certain lenses so it's especially useful with wide angle lenses sometimes you look at a photo that you've taken and you don't even see anything wrong with it until you use this distortion correction so have a look at this hotel here this is a photo taken in isle of white and we stayed in this hotel over here apparently supposed to be haunted but fortunately or unfortunately we didn't see any ghosts while we were there but have a look at this hotel it's taken with the canon 18 to 55 millimeter lens so it's kind of a wide angle lens at 18 millimeters go ahead and look at that hotel and i'm going to click distortion right now and have a look how it corrected it so it kind of stretched it out i wasn't even aware that there was distortion but there clearly was so if i undo that have a look at the people's heads here and faces on the bus as well if i redo it it just stretches and corrects that fisheye effect to make the photo much more linear than it was before and likewise here you can control the amount that you want to do this sometimes 120 is the max you can go to but if you do minus 20 it actually makes a fisheye even more i'm just going to leave it at about 100 which is the default i find that the defaults are really good on here and that it works now up next we're moving on to this effects thing over here now if you do figure out how to use this please let me know because i have not been able to use this at all and in all my photos this is disabled no matter what i do even if we switch on this digital lens optimizer the effects just stay switched off so i don't know if this is applicable for only certain lenses or if it's to do with the camera model i'm not sure i haven't been able to find anything in the canon guide about this as well so i'm just going to skip this part over here and moving on to the last part which is sharpness now i've got a really good video that i've done about sharpness i'll put the links to all my canon videos in the description should you wish to go and view some of them but i will briefly just show you how sharpness works best way to use sharpness is go up here and click on this button and then select something in your photo where you can really see the sharpness would affect so i'm just going to click on this kind of balcony railing over here and you can see it's up here so now i'm going to switch on my sharpness and there's two options under sharpness so you've got sharpness on its own I'm gonna switch that off for now and this is the easy way if you just want to do something really quick and correct the sharpness use this part here so as you 
can see, look at this image here in this window. When I increase the sharpness, let's say to 50%, and you can see this got much sharper. So if I switch this off, switch this on, it corrected the sharpness for you. But there is a slightly better way to use sharpness, which is the unsharp mask. Now, the unsharp mask is good because it gives you more control over what you're doing with the sharpness. So if you've got images that you really care about and you really want to get the image looking the best you can and you've got time, use this unsharp mask. It's really good. So how this works is the same option that we've seen before in the previous sharpness selection is here, the strength. So what we can do is we can increase the strength. Let's say we make it 50% like we did in the previous one. As you can see, switching this on and off, you can see the difference it has made so far. And then over here is the fineness. Now the fineness works off what you've selected here for strength. So say for example, we'd select strength zero, you can see it's gone back to being blurry. And if we adjust the fineness now, nothing really happens. So the fineness has to be working together with the strength option over here. So I move strength to five and now I use the fineness and say I move it to eight. You can see how it made it really overly sharp right now. So this is really strong. If I move it to 10, it made it even more sharper, but to a point where it doesn't look natural or good. So fineness, let's say three, let's go before and after still a bit strong, but I think two is kind of good. So fineness two, sharpness four maybe even. I think that looks pretty good. You can do it before and after. I think that looks all right, but you'll notice that when you do make things in your image a bit sharper, it introduces this kind of little bit of noise in the background. So by making your image too sharp, you're going to introduce a lot of noise into the image. And that's where this threshold comes in. So by using this threshold, you're kind of counteracting what happens with the noise here. So threshold, let's increase that to six, for example. And as you can see, that noise is disappearing now and makes your image a lot clearer and it's still sharper so if I switch off this is before this is after so we've got our image much sharper without introducing too much noise now I mean you could increase this all the way to 10 and it will clear your noise but sometimes it might make your image a little bit blurry again if you make the threshold too much so I, I usually leave the threshold at about six somewhere like that depending on how much strength I used for sharpness now obviously if you use strength six for sharpness and maybe finesse something higher you might want to bring the threshold up quite high as well and you see how good that looks even though we've increased the fineness and the strength quite a bit this was before this is after so it's up to you how you like your images to look but that's basically how it looks and now this is a cool window because you can see that zoomed in without it being zoomed in and these photos being so high resolution you can't really see all the differences but if you did have to crop this photo and zoom in you might start noticing differences look here so once it loads this is with our sharpness on this is without our sharpness on so you can clearly see a difference with the sharpness without the sharpness. So it's really good to use all the zoom in functions when adjusting all these details so you can see exactly what you're doing. By the way, the name of the hotel that we stayed in is the Royal Espinada Hotel and it's in the Isle of Wight in the UK should you wish to visit. Really old kind of looking hotel but it's really cool and nice and it's in a perfect location where we stayed which made our trip really good. If I scroll down there's no more options here. This is just a window that tells you the image information. So for example this was taken with the Canon 90D and the settings that I've used are also shown here. So I hope you enjoyed this tutorial and I hope it helps you out. And that's all I've got for today in this tutorial. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something useful that will help you on your journey to editing great photographs. So if you did enjoy this video, do give me a thumbs up and do remember to subscribe to this channel. Hopefully I'll be making many cool videos to come in the future. So as always, thanks for watching. Stay safe, take care and goodbye.